please the court. Counsel, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. On March 16, 2014, Detective Keith Sandy shot James Boyd because it was his duty. His duty to ensure that his fellow officer did not become another statistic of another officer who had been killed by a criminal. Officer Dominic Perez also shot James Boyd because he also perceived the same threat to a fellow officer. Two officers following their training, two officers perceiving in the very same split second the same deadly threat against a fellow officer. Two officers doing their duty. The government wants you to believe that two officers who never spoke to each other at all that same day, on the very same split second, decided to become murderers. Seriously? Really? Because that's what they're, that's what they're trying to argue to you. The first thing I want to do is I want to, I want to remind you of what their expert witness said when he testified, their use of force expert, he said, if indeed Mr. Boyd took a step or a lunge towards the officers, if he took a step or lunge towards the officers, then the officers' use of deadly force would have been justi justified. Take a look. If I showed you the video and I showed you the step, that would be enough to prove that the opportunity was there. I see the video. It, it, if indeed Mr. Boyd took a step or a lunge toward the officers, if he took a step or a lunge toward the officers, then the officers used deadly force to the vigil. Okay. That's enough. Okay, thank you. Can you switch it to me? Can you turn the elbow now? Mm -hmm. So, he took a step or a lunge. It would be the officer's duty, their sworn duty as police officers to shoot Mr. Boyd. The government's entire case rests on the belief that they've proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no step taken. That's their entire case. Based on their own expert. Their entire case is, have they proved to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Boyd never took a step? Of course not. That's ludicrous. We all have eyes. We all saw the video. Interesting, though, the government never played the video once during this entire case. They come up in closing and tell you, watch the video, watch the video. They never even played it once. They took some shots where they wanted to take shots just some, and some slides and just put them in front of you. Let's remember some of the highlights of Mr. Noble, their use of force expert. He testified to, as we've already just saw, if Boyd steps or lunges towards the officers, then they would be justified in shooting him. He testified if Keith Sandy perceived an immediate deadly threat, it was his sworn duty to shoot Mr. Boyd. That was his testimony. He testified, at first, he said, a bullet entrance location has no bearing on the justification of the shooting, and then he changed his answer right in the middle of that. If you might remember, I was, by the way, I'm getting drug into technology, so I'm still using old flip charts, and I, and I still like to use them because it's, it's real time. I'm writing down what they're saying at the time, and, and back when it comes to this point in time in the case, sometimes we can be reminded of what was said by the witnesses. So the bullet entrance location has no bearing on justification of the shoot. So that's what I wrote down originally, and then he changed his mind when he realized that didn't help too much the state's contention and their big brouhaha about the fact that one of the bullets ended through the back. He would not be here unless he was paid. Oh, nine feet. He says that Officer Weimerskirch was nine feet away from Mr. Boyd when Mr. Boyd was shot. Boyd never surrendered. Their own witness says that, folks. Their own witness says that Boyd never surrendered. Now, let's think real hard, it won't take long, to tell me what witness said that Boyd surrendered then. I 
I can't come up with one. They can't come up with one. She'll argue it all day long. She'll argue he's falling down and surrendering. Where's the evidence? That's what this place is about. A courtroom is about evidence. Where's the evidence that he surrendered? I don't care how many times they say it. It doesn't make it so. Put someone in a witness stand to say it. Put someone who was there to say it. Another thing he told us was Mr. Boyd was not controlled. Once control of combative subject is gained has no bearing on the issue of this case. He doesn't know what Keith Sandy perceived. He doesn't know what Dominic Perez perceived. He would not testify in this case unless he's getting paid. And this is the first criminal case that he's ever testified in as an expert. He never visited the scene of this incident. He never even went up there. This is their expert. He never personally evaluated the terrain. He never spoke to the lead investigator, Jeff Stone. And he never had been to New Mexico before the day he testified. And apparently, based on his own testimony and that you can judge his credibility, he never watched the video either to look for a step. Mr. Noble is the only witness, the only witness that provided any testimony even coming close to saying that Keith Sandy and Dominic Perez should not have shot. He's the only witness that they brought that said that. Nobody else has testified before you of any sort. And this is the same man they wanted, but, but he didn't arrow it, didn't he? He said they shouldn't have shot unless it was a step. But then he didn't see a step. <clears throat> His entire opinion is based on Mr. Boyd not taking a step towards the officers. If, if could, it, it could be said that the government's entire case, and I've already said this, rests on that step. Here's, here's, here's a question I want you all to think about. If you are a police officer and you are following your training and you are following the SOPs, the procedural orders, and you don't violate any of those, you're doing everything you're supposed to do, how can you be guilty of murder? How does that happen? Mr. Robles pointed out that the the very government that trains these officers, the state government, trains these officers, this is what you're supposed to do. Tells them what they're supposed to do, how they're trained, how they're supposed to react in that split second to save a fellow officer's life. And when they do it, prosecuted for murder. Who would ever want to be a police officer? The same state prosecuting them after they train them? We'll never have another police officer. Jeff Stone testified that Keith Sandy, Jeff Stone, the lead investigator, sat here, testified for a long time. Probably the person that knows more about this case as far as the investigation than anybody else was asked a series of questions from me. So the use, let me, is the Elmo on the Okay. So the use of force SOP that we're going through, States Exhibit 1, remember this, the use of force? Yes. You didn't find any provision that Keith Sandy violated, did you? As far as use of force? Yes. Answer, no. Now what was Keith Sandy's one and only job on that hill on that evening preceding Mr. Boyd being shot? He was providing lethal cover for, cover for Officer Scott Weimerskirts. Now, you just testified earlier that apparently, I think you testified, if I heard you right, that perhaps Mr. Weimerskirts closed ground a little too quick. Answer, that he did. Question, that was a mistake on his part, you believe? Answer, yes, it was a mistake on his part. Okay, you've been a veteran, you've been a police officer for a lot of years now. How many years total? As a police officer, yes. Over nine years. Okay, when a fellow police officer makes a mistake like that, and he goes up the hill when he shouldn't be following right behind the dog, same kind of situation. You just let him go and say, I know I'm lethal cover. Sorry, you're on your own. 
Question, do you just let him go? Answer, no, it's your responsibility to cover him. Even if he's made the mistake of getting too close, you try to, if you can, try to prevent it from getting too close. That's if it's all possible. But it's still your responsibility to keep coverage of him. Make sure that he's safe. Okay? Okay, and that goes, and that goes with him. Even if he's getting too close to an armed subject, right? Your job is always to make sure he's safe. Yes. And that's your only job, right? Yes. In fact, that's your sworn duty, isn't it? Yes. That was Keith Sandy's sworn duty on that day. And he lived up to his sworn duty on that day. We cannot train police officers, these two police officers, and tell them and order them that if they order them, we order them. If they perceive a deadly threat, you must shoot to stop the deadly threat on a fellow officer. We cannot train him that way and then prosecute him when they do it. Now, James, Boy James Boyd's death was tragic. As any death is tragic. This is a criminal case, though. This courtroom is not the place to address other issues. Now, the way we, as a society, handle the mentally ill should be addressed but not in this courtroom. The way the Albuquerque Police Department handled this situation in general should probably be addressed, but not in this courtroom. Because this is a criminal case. We are judging those two men, those two good men, and only those two men. To say that these two officers are guilty of murder is not supported by the facts, nor is it supported by the law. I do want to take an opportunity right now to go few, through a few of the jury instructions that the court gave you. Now, this is the law of this case. The courts told you that this is what you have to follow. Those of you, when you go in there and you, and you, let me read it to you, but I'm highlighting the yellow part. It's about your duty as a juror. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching a verdict. We need you to stand up for Keith Sandy and Dominic Paris in there. We need you to stand up for these two good men. Another instruction. The availability of less lethal tools at the scene is not relevant to your determination of whether the elements of justifiable homicide by a public officer or employee have been met. I know I saw some jury questions that came up regarding some of these issues. That's understandable based on the way the state was presenting its case, but this is the law. Whether or not there was a beanbag shotgun close by, whether or not there was, whether or not, by God, maybe Keith should have thrown the flashbang a little better, but it just worked. That's all hindsight, that's all 2020. Mr. Robles went over that in detail with you. But the fact of the matter is non-lethal is not what's in question here. It's not relevant. The plan that the state spent excruciating amounts of time during the last three weeks trying to discuss, it's not relevant here. What's relevant is that split-second decision that they made. And that's the only thing that's relevant two officers that never talked to each other made that decision each independently because of the deadly threat posed to a fellow officer. We talked about in Detective Stone's questions just then. This may have been Officer Wamerskirt's fault. It got so close. That doesn't relieve the duty of these two officers. The law is this. Whether the actions of a person being defended played a role in creating the need to use the force is not relevant to your determination of whether the elements of justifiable homicide by a public officer and or elements of justifiable homicide in defense of another have been met. It doesn't matter that he made a mistake. It doesn't matter if, 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 this, if there were other mistakes made on that hill. It doesn't matter that there were 19 officers. It doesn't matter this large perimeter around it. It doesn't matter how many bullets they had on them, what type of guns they had on them. That does not matter. 
What matters is the perception of these two men, of what they saw, of based on their training and experience, based on the orders that they are required to follow. That's the only thing that matters here. All that other stuff is just smoke and mirrors put up here by the state because they want a conviction. The state is willing just about to say anything and do anything to get under a conviction in this case. I'll get more to that in just a minute. And what other officers did, this is another instruction for you. The defendants cannot be held responsible for the independent decisions and actions of another officer. You shall disregard any witness opinion to the contrary. It doesn't matter who called out the canine first. It doesn't matter, but here's, here's the deal. They're asking, if you remember, um, it's, it's almost three weeks now, a couple weeks ago, whenever we started this case, um, the prosecutor gave an opening, an opening statement. It's kind of important. It's what they believe. It's not evidence, but it's kind of important what they believe they're going to show you, what the evidence is going to show. And I told you in my opening statement that you were going to get an opportunity someday to hold the prosecutor responsible for the things that she says in opening. That day has come. Let's review just a little bit of what this prosecutor said. <coughs> And, and I guess the reason is they have to, the, the facts don't support this prosecution. So they have to craft some kind of story to fit something to justify bringing these charges to begin with. But let's go with it. So they're crafting a story. So, so <laughs> Ms. Ms. McGinn in the, in the opening said he was listening to the radio Okay, she cleared that up in this closing, right? It was a phone, she agreed, now she made a mistake. But that's not the critical part. So he wanted to run down and be a part of it. That's the storyline she wanted to give you all in the opening, that he wanted to run down and be a part of it. I'm pretty sure he would have rather been still shopping with his wife at Walmart than going through with what he had to do on that day. But they have to give it a context. They have to make Keith Sandy out to be this bad guy, cowboy cop, which is the farthest thing from the truth the farthest thing from the truth. But she's got to give that kind of a context. And throughout, it's interwoven these little complete falsities that she puts in her opening. I went at great lengths with Detective Stone to take him piece by piece what she said to prove that none of it was true. In fact, at one point, she even got up in this courtroom and said, now that Mr. Bregman's called me a liar for the last 30 minutes. I didn't call her a liar. That's her own conscience talking to her. Can I get a page of line for that quote that Mr. Brinkle just made? No, I don't have it right here written down. Because it's not in the transcript. I've got it here. Well, I guess that's the point. So, then I asked Detective Stone. I'm reading from the opening to Detective Stone. Keith Sandy, he was not dispatched to the scene where the shooting took place, but overheard something on the radio and on his own assembled a team of his rope members and went out on the scene. Would you agree that's truthful? Detective Stone, no. But the truth doesn't fit her narrative. How about this one? Tell me, this is a question I asked Detective Stone. Tell me if this statement is true about what was happening up there. Quote, the opening, including one more CIT officer, crisis intervention trained officer. He was actually the one who had been negotiating with Mr. Boyd. He too was sent away by defendant Sandy and the rope team when they arrived on the scene rather than let him continue to talk to Mr. Boyd, but they sent him right away there. Now me speaking, my question, is that accurate? Is it a true statement that Keith Sandy and the rope team sent away CIT officer? Answer, no. So another question to Detective Stone. So let me ask you if you believe this statement is true. Was it, what, what was the crime that merited this kind of response? Illegal camping? That I asked him. Now is that a true statement? No, that's not why they all came out there. See, the prosecution wanted to paint this terrible picture of the Albuquerque Police Department as all showing up for illegal camping. They want to completely downplay the fact that this man who's six foot two pulled out two knives and threatened to kill the officers. 
completely downplay that. Oh, he was just a nice guy. It's a mentally ill man who threatened police officers and committed the crime of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. There is a response to that, thank God, in this community by Albuquerque Police Department. They respond to that by saying, you're going you're to get arrested? We're going to go arrest you? You're going to put down the knives. That's what we need you to do. Put down the knives. You can't do that. I can go on. I want, I want one more. <laughs> this one you can judge on your own. Let me ask you about this statement. This was my question to Detective Stone. Do you believe this is correct about Mr. Boyd? Quote, he's encircled. This is right before he's shot. He's encircled. He can't escape. He can't get away. He can't harm anybody. Is that an accurate statement? No. This was his answer. He can't harm anybody. That's the story she wanted you to believe when this started. Does anybody believe that today? I'm skipping a bunch. You don't need to hear all of them because you heard them the first time. Detective Stone still asking this question. Let me ask you if you believe this statement is true or not, I asked Detective Stone. Michael, now I'm quoting from the opening. Michael Manette will tell you the time is on his side. The more you can talk to someone, the more you can wear them down. They get tired, they get hungry, they want food, and you can talk them down. Except for one thing. He was not allowed to continue talking to him, and that's because of Keith Sandy. I asked Detective Stone, is that even close to being true? He responded by saying, well, again, the order to do tactical withdrawal came from Officer Jeff McFarlane over the radio. Keith Sandy didn't stop Officer Met from, Met from talking to Mr. Boyd, did he? No. There is an obsession in the arguments and the questions in this case to make Keith Sandy look like this terrible cop. It's the farthest thing from the truth. The motivations, I, I don't know what the motivation is, but here we have a man who for 19 years has been a police officer in this state and has never been disciplined, never been disciplined for use of force, has never shot at anybody in 19 years until this matter. She wants to talk about badge heavy with her questions. There wasn't one witness that said he was badge heavy. There wasn't one witness that said he was a bad cop. But she wants to argue it all day long because it fits her story. Because it fits the government's story. That's the only way. Because if we look at the evidence, there's nothing there. There are certain facts, and let's just talk about the facts that are un undisputable in this case, that we have to continue to remind ourselves of. Mr. Boyd had an extensive, violent history, including violence against police officers. Mr. Boyd committed the violent felony that day of aggravated assault on police officers with a deadly weapon. He threatened to kill police officers repeatedly. You've heard him. You've heard him so many times over the last two weeks, that voice. I'm sure we'll, it's going to take a while to get that voice out of your head. But you've heard him continuing to threaten officers, to stab them in their neck, to wait till it's dark because he can hunt them down and kill them. And there he's going home to his family, but they're not. Those are the kinds of comments that were coming out of Mr. Boyd's mouth that night. And despite what the prosecution wants you to believe, it didn't matter what type of police uniform they were wearing. He threatened them all. Mr. Boyd pulled out his knives numerous times while also at the same time threatening to kill the police officers. He never, he never, he never, he never surrendered. And I don't care how many times the government wants to say he was surrendering, we all know that's not true. When you are told, with, with three officers coming up at you on the hill, a dog coming up at you, and you're told, get on the ground, I don't have to raise my voice this time to do it. Get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. And what's your response? You pull out two knives. Since when ever has that ever been a surrender? It's not a surrender. It's what it is, is I'm going to carry through. 
with one of my threats. But then again, the government has the view. The government in this case has the view because they even asked it in the question of Ronald McCarthy. They actually imply, ah, they said it today. Only seven officers have been killed by knives in the last 10 years. What's too many? Apparently, it's not eight. If you're surrendering, you drop your knives and you get on the ground. If you're surrendering, you don't even pick, pull your knives out unless you're pulling them out to throw them on the ground. If you're surrendering, you get on the ground. You put your hands up. You say, I give. You don't throw your stuff down in a fighting stance like you're getting ready to fight and pull out two knives. It's a simple fact that we all inherently know it, but let's say it anyways. The arrest team officers had to arrest Mr. Boyd. We weren't going to let him down the mountain. We weren't going to leave him alone. That's not the way law, the law is observed in this city or this state. If you break the law, commit a felony, you have to get arrested. If there's mental health issues, which clearly there are, then that's dealt with. But you still get arrested. You don't get a pass because you're mentally ill. You don't get to pull out two guns if you're mentally ill. And we all know that knives are a deadly weapon. We know that knives are a deadly threat, especially at nine feet. We also know this fact, and I've said it already, but I'll say it again. If Keith Sandy perceives a deadly threat to a fellow officer, he must use his lethal force as a cover to stop the threat. It is his duty. If Dominic Perez perceives a deadly threat to a fellow officer, he must use his lethal force as cover to stop that threat. It is, du it is, it is his duty. Mr. Boyd had the advantage of elevation three and a half feet higher. Gosh, we recreated that a little bit. Yesterday I was a little nervous staying up on top of that stand. And I was pretty sure it was scary to me. But I think it drove home a very important point. That's what this officer was dealing with. There was a huge discrepancy in elevation. Whether or not the government wants to say it's right to the inch, I'm not suggesting it's right to the inch of what it was out there. But what I am suggesting is it gives you an understanding how close, that high up, what the, what's the reactionary gap between that and that? My gosh, how scary. But it, apparently, they want to put up a little video, they want to put up a video of a previous training today and say, oh, it's within 10 feet, you could shot him, shoot him. Is that what we wait for? Do we wait for the officer to actually have the knife coming out of his neck before we are justified in shooting? Or, according to the government, with their go and no go, are they actually arguing that because he was turning, if they'd shot him a second or a half second, maybe only a half second earlier, it would have been justified? It seems like that's what they're arguing almost. That can't be the case. It can't be that if you're a half second late on your shot, that you're guilty of murder. So when they talk about this go, no go signal, that's really what they're saying. Another fact, Mr. Boyd was nine feet away from Officer Weimerschgers, well, no one agrees with that, too. When Mr. Boyd was shot, he was holding knives in his hands. That's true. Two officers never spoke to each other that day, Officer Perez and Officer Sandy, and both shot him within a split second. Officer Ingram perceived his dame, the same deadly threat, and he was just a few feet away from Mr. Boyd. Very quickly, Mr. Melvin also agreed with me, as I've already pointed out. He <coughs> steps or lunges and justified the shoot. It's his duty. He didn't know what Officer Ferris said or, office, or perceived or Officer Sandy perceived. Let's go to the other officer that was there, that was absolutely on scene right there, Officer Ingram. Officer Ingram came, came by. He was the acting sergeant, if you remember. Boyd never surrendered. Well, that's a constant theme in every witness, isn't it? He was right there, too. 
Boyd never surrendered. A knife at that distance equals a gun. He had a Scorpio camera, mace to the eyes, inflammatory, and then Boyd was a deadly threat. That was his perception, that Boyd was a deadly threat. Weimar Schertz was in charge of the plan and arresting, and Ingram was going to be hands on. The three officers now that you've heard from that were there perceived a deadly threat. If you want to believe the government's case, you have to believe that all these officers took the stand and lied. Robert Johnson testified. Robert Johnson was in, is, is the trainer over at APD. I asked him the following question. Are they trained that when officers are approaching to effectuate an arrest, if the subject pulls knives out of his pocket, that that would be an attack? Yes, it would definitely, it, it would be definitely a threat, and if, it, if the officers were close enough, it would be an attack. So when she puts up the reactive control model, and a closing and talks about the, even though it's just a training, visual training device, and says, look, the attack. They're trained that what they saw was the attack. They don't wait till actually the knife is in someone's neck. They're trained that what they, that he was displaying was an attack on the police officers. Just to be clear, they are trained that a person with two knives eight to nine feet away threatens a police officer. It is their duty and obligation to shoot that person. You may not like that. You may not. But it's their duty, it's the way they're trained, and it's what they have to do, and it's what they're sworn to do. There was also the testimony of Ron McCarthy. And by the way, Sergeant Fox, I saw the, I was standing over there during the opening, and I saw Sergeant Fox, the, the SWAT team member, over on the right side with, uh, with, with um, their, expert, the picture of um, Mr. Noble. Sergeant Fox was very clear about what eminent threat was, what means and opportunity were. Very clear. Don't let for one second the government fool you into believing that he testified that something that these two gentlemen did was wrong. It's not the case. She can put him on whatever side and whatever arrow she wants on her screen, but give as much credibility to her closing argument and her rebuttal argument right after I talk as you do to her opening argument. You give it the same weight and credibility that this argument deserves. There was a testimony of Ron McCarthy. Ron McCarthy, 70-some years old. Uh, clearly someone who understands the parameters under which police officers work and when, less, when, when lethal use of force is authorized. He has 10 years of, I'm sorry, he has years of hands-on experience with the Los Angeles Police Department and SWAT team and then went on to work with the Department of Justice to train chiefs of police and officers in the use of lethal force. He told you that 20 to 30,000 officers have been trained on his guides for use of force. And he told you that Keith Sandy was justified in shooting Mr. Boyd. He told you that. All that experience, all that expertise, someone that the Department of Justice relies upon. And they tell you don't believe a word he says. Keith Sandy testified, didn't he? These officers testified. They came up and told you what happened. They told you what they saw and what they perceived. They told you why they shot Mr. Boyd. And Keith Sandy told you about the movement he saw. He didn't say he saw the step himself. But he did say he saw the movement coming towards. With the, with the knives out, the movement coming towards. <coughs> On March 16th, 2014, these two men followed their training. 
you know, we, we don't have the hindsight. We, don't, we, we can't reverse things and say, all right, don't shoot, see what happens to Officer Warmishkirtz. We don't know if he'd still be alive. We don't know if he would have been stabbed. We don't know what would have happened. But we know the way they're trained and what they perceive and what they have to do based on that perception. These two men perceived the deadly threat and took the necessary action to stop the threat to a fellow police officer. These two men followed their sworn duty when they shot Mr. Boyd. To believe otherwise, as I said, would be to believe that their entire witnesses, with the exception of no, and the every single person that stood up there, and when the, when the judge swore in and they put their hand, every single one of them that swore to tell the truth was not telling the truth. That's what you have to believe to believe the government's case in that. This, this case is completely turned upside on its head. When, when prosecutors are diminishing the fact that seven police officers died at the hands of a knife, and basically having to argue that everybody, including the, the, the people that have investigated the thing, are not telling the truth. Because, unless the prosecution is willing to agree that they, they did not use excessive force. Detective Stone said it was not, didn't violate the policy. Didn't violate the use of force policy. When she's giving you this rebuttal after I'm done, just keep, keep answering, it. just keep asking yourself in your mind, where is the evidence that he was surrendering? Where is the testimony from anybody, including their own, that he was surrendering? Where is that testimony? There isn't any, and that's why their case falls on its face. I want to thank you for your service. It's been a long trial. But right now, as you sit here right now in this courtroom, you're the most powerful people in Albuquerque. These two men need you to do justice. We all know that the government sometimes just gets it wrong. These two men, these two good men, need you to stand up to the government and tell them, don't prosecute cops for following the very same training that their government tells them to follow. These two men need you to recognize what the Supreme Court has told us and is in the Albuquerque the Police Department's use of force SOP. Start at the reasonableness. The reasonableness of an officer's use of force must be evaluated from the perspective of the reasonable officer on scene at the time of the action rather than with 2020 hindsight. You guys can probably recite this now on your own. The United States Supreme Court <coughs> recognized some allowance must be made for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split second decisions with limited information in situations which are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. When I showed you that in the opening, I told you that's exactly what this case is. That's exactly what you've learned the evidence to be. That's exactly what happened on that hill. These two men need you to say no to arguments made by the prosecution that are not supported by evidence. These two men need you to say loudly and clearly that they did not have murder in their hearts. They're just doing their job. These two men need you to say loudly and clearly that we cannot make officers swear to do their duty and then prosecute them for doing just that. In the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, justice, justice, justice shall you pursue. These two men need you to do justice today and find them not guilty of all charges. Thank you, Your Honor.